Drinking from the Twitter hot fire hose uh, requires parsing tweets and filtering the parsed content. Ideally, from a code modularity perspective, these two operations should be kept separate. But from a performance perspective, we would rather combine these to avoid using excessive resources to get information that isn't of interest. Manahar will present a generalizable technique to achieve both good code modularity and good performance. Manahar's talk is titled Specializing Parsers for Queries. Thank you. Um, please let me know if I am speaking too loud in the, into the microphone. OK, if that's not the case, it's good. Um, so yes, the title was Staged Parser Combinate, I mean, pars Specializing Parsers for Queries. And uh, the other thing that was, uh, was that my Twitter handle was wrong. So this is the real me, and this is the real title of the talk. And uh, so we're going to talk about the first part in the specializing parsers for queries today, namely staged parser combinators. Uh, so uh, quick background. I'm a PhD student uh, at EPFL Switzerland, and uh, I'm going to be soon uh, done. Uh, apart from that, everything else is there. I will we'll come back to the little guy on the left at the very end. So this talk is about a fast parser combinator library. It's about how and why it is fast. Uh, it's about you know some theory behind it all. And at the end, we can have a little use case uh, for macros and DSL. So in this talk, I will try to show how we will use macros to, optim to do implement optimizing DSLs. Um, let me. Could we test the, oh yeah, very good. It's easier for me to look at that screen once uh, I'm turned around. So anyway, the take home message uh, for this talk is that we're gonna turn the composition of parsers, uh, so parser combinators are a composition of parsers, and we're gonna systematically turn these into staged parser combinators, and those are composition of code generators for parsers. So, a fast parser combinator library, it's now available uh, online. It's called parse query. And uh, yeah, you can go and uh, take a look at it at the, hopefully at the end of the talk. Please stick with me till then. So this is how you use uh, this library. Uh, this is a JSON parser. The key thing is uh, you use this optimized block in which you stick your parser. And the optimized block is a macro. Namely, it's a black box macro. And so, uh, it will uh, take whatever is inside, transform it, and give you back a, uh, an optimized version of the parser uh, at the very end. So what does this macro allow as syntax inside? Well, it takes a uh, sequence of parser declarations. And uh, so here you see this is a, a traditional JSON parser, which uh, is actually taken from uh, Martin's book uh, from back in the day, uh, Programming in Scala. And uh, so at the very end, you need to have a final parser that you return. Uh, and of course, you can use the parser uh, by calling it on a reader. So you have a reader here, which is a uh, character reader. Uh, and uh, so you just run the, the parser on the reader. And you have two possibilities, of course. Either the input succeeds or it fails. So how fast is it, right? Uh, that's, the very, that's the fun question. So here's, uh, you can actually, once you check, check out the repo, you can try drawing the benchmarks yourselves. And on the JSON parser, so we have for this uh, benchmark here, you can see at the very end, it's uh, tweets 9700, which means it's a 10 meg tweet file. And we're about 2.5 times faster. But more than how fast is it, the interesting question really is, why is it faster? Or why is it fast at all? And so, for that, let me go and show you what parser combinators look like idiomatically, because then we will go into why it is, th it is this way. So what is a parser combinator? A parser combinator is a function that takes an input and returns a result. Right? It tries to read some sort of input and tries to create a structure out of this input. So uh, well, and uh, so in this type signature, you will see that we have a parser of t, which means it is going to parse an input and return potentially a result, which is of type t. And uh, you saw in the previous example that a parser for JSON is a parser of type JS value. And uh, so what is a parse result? Well, a parse result has, you have two uh, 
uh, options, really. You have either it's a success or a failure. So either you succeed on parsing your inputs, in which case uh, you return uh, the element itself, and there may be some remaining input, uh, or you fail and you, uh, and you exit with an error message. And finally, so what is input itself? So the input, in this case, we have said that it's a reader of elements. So the elements itself can be uh, generic. In our previous example, we looked at a char reader, a character reader. So in that case, element would be char. And uh, so the reader would have the following interface, which is, you know, get me the first element, uh, let me know if I'm at the end of my source, and finally, when I have an element, give me the rest of the input. So this is a very idiomatic implementation of parser combinators. And you have the following combinators. Now, how do you create uh, complex parsers from simple ones? So the simplest parsers possible are given at the very bottom. You have accept if, which, ex which succeeds if uh, the element passes the predicate passed in pa as a parameter. And so you can uh, create a combinator for accept uh, for a single element using accept if. So this is the re this is what we mean by reusing the combinator approach, and we don't need to implement special functions uh, for different uh, parsers. Uh, then you have, uh, inside the parser class, you have other methods, which are combinators. You have the little squiggly thing, the tilde, which is the concat parser. What it does is it succeeds if the left one succeeds and the right one succeeds, and it gives you back a pair uh, containing both the elements. The OR parser uh, succeeds if either uh, the left-hand side works or the right-hand side parses. And I'm very sorry, there is a uh, type signature error there. It should be OR and returns a parser of T, of course. And what you can do, which is nice, is you can transform the results of a uh, parser, right? So once you parse a, uh, an element, you can apply a function to that element. And uh, usually you would use this for, say, instance, to convert a parser for a digit, which returns a character, into the integer itself. Uh, and another very important one is the repetition parser. So you want to be able to rep uh, repeatedly parse a sequence of elements. All right. So, well, why is, uh, why are, why is fast parse query uh, faster than the others? Well, what is the problem? The problem is these red, uh, these, uh, red combinators, right? When you run them on an input, each of these uh, participate in creating intermediate data structures all over the place. So as we saw before, a parser is a function from input to parse result. So every single time you parse a, uh, an element, you're going to create an instance of parse result, whether it's a success or a failure. And for all intents and purposes, success and failure are just boxes, really, right? So they don't need to exist for the logic itself. And uh, similarly, uh, you have uh, issues with, uh, you have similar issues with uh, repetition parsers themselves. Um, so you really want to avoid creating all these intermediate objects. And why uh, we got such good results for performance with parse query is because we are able to systematically eliminate all intermediate data structures. And so how do we do this? Well, we do this with a macro. Uh, but actually, we use theory to do this, and the theory is called uh, we take we uh, we use uh, something called multi-stage programming, and I will uh, explain this in step two here. So I will go th let's let's go through this as you know as if we would program this ourselves, which is we need to do three things. We first need to uh, lift the user level parsers that were described that were described in the optimized macro to uh, the domain specific AST. And uh, so there are some standard techniques to do these with macros, and uh, it's nice to just go through them once. Then we will stage each declared parser. So this is the critical part, which we will go into more detail later. And finally, uh, we partially evaluate them. What that means is the third step uh, participates in completely eliminating all intermediate data structures. And uh, yeah, and then we're done, and then we run the parser finally. So what is how do you get uh, to step one? Well. Step one, uh, we have uh, you know Eugene and Dennis who gave us uh, macros and quasi quotes. So why don't we use all of them? So inside a uh, macro scope, we have a sequence of parser declarations, and 
each statement, uh, we want them to look like that, right? We want them to look like as if it's a name uh, which has uh, type parameters and it has a return type. So the difference between what is in bold there, the G grammar, and the others is that so name, uh, which is of type term name, and red type, which is of type uh, type, these are uh, known by the macros reflection library. So you get access to these uh, once you use uh, the macros, right? But the thing is that grammar is a domain-specific item, right? Grammar is what we want to analyze because we're in a parser combinator library. And so uh, grammar is something we need to build. So this is grammar, right? Why don't we, so we could build an AST which is very specific to parser combinators. And you see that here I'm cheating a bit because uh, ideally what you want to have is something similar to parser of t where t is a type parameter. But here I'm cheating, I'm saying that uh, grammar has a member which is of type type. The reason I'm allowed to cheat a little bit is because we are already in the macro world and so we have access to types as values, right? And uh, well, this makes our life a bit easier for the implementation, but you can think of this as a, uh, uh, I mean, a grammar of T. Um, all right, so then how do you take the other, the, the other step is how do you take and lift every grammar declared in the optimized macroscope to this grammar representation? And once again, you do this using quasi-quotes and by providing an instance of uh, this unliftable of grammar. So uh, this is actually a very nice way for you to lift any uh, code declared in a macro into your specific DSL. And once you have your DSL, so you have your own AST for grammars, then we can do fun stuff with them, which is exactly stage two. So the fun stuff, what does it do? Uh, we are going to call it, we're going to call this method stage, and it's a stage, so it takes a grammar and gives you back a staged parser. Um, now, what is the difference between a parser and a staged parser? So a parser that I introduced to you earlier was in uh, the user land, right? Now this, whereas this staged parser is in the macro world. But before we go through that, let's see what staging actually means, right? So consider this very uh, simple example of a function that takes um, three integers and adds them. So when you evaluate it classically, when you run the program add three with one, two, three, it expectedly gives you six. Now say uh, you have, not, you always know what the values of B and C are, but you don't know what the value of A is. So you want to say in some way that I will know the value of A later in life, I mean in the life of the program, but I know B and C. So you can add something that is called a rep type. So what you're saying is A is a representation of an int. It is a symbolic ex uh, representation of an int, but I know uh, B and C very well. Um, so, and then you can still use, uh, you can still write an expression which is A plus B plus C. And so what then you, what you can do then is, okay, this is good. Uh, so once again, A is an expression which is going to be evaluated in the next staged. So you have staged A, to, and, but B and C themselves are executed during staging time. So what you do is essentially you do some sort of code generation and that gives you a uh, specialized function for the inputs uh, that you've given here, which are two and three. And during code generation time, what's happening is that you have partially evaluated uh, parts of the function. And so you get a specialized function, which just requires A now. And of course, when you add, when you call it with one, it gives you back the expected result. So once again, what you're trying to do here is you're, you have separated or you have identified what parts of your computations are static and what parts of your computation are dynamic. In our case, in this example, the static computation was A, uh, was B plus C, and the dynamic computation was A plus five. So why is this, so, uh, so why have I gone through this? Because we can use this uh, idea for parser combinators, right? Uh, well, 
so yeah let's 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 go from here so what happens with the parser combinators let, maybe i can quickly go back i'm sorry i missed to take that slide back yeah so what do we see here we see that in this scope we always know statically how the parsers are composed Actually, they are very precisely in the tilde, the or. Uh, they're also in the rep-sep parser. They're in the accept parser. So all these combinators that we've used from the library are static compositions. The only thing that is dynamic in is running the parser on an input at runtime, right? Everything else can be partially evaluated away. So let's get to that. Uh, this is the user interface that I showed you earlier. And what does it mean? Well, a parser of t is a function. What is the static part of this? The static part is uh, the function itself. The dynamic parts are uh, the value, uh, the, uh, the values t inside success are the rest. Actually, they're not even the rest. They are first at end. Those are the dynamic values. Everything else is static. So we can actually try to take this library and lift it to the macro world so that uh, we keep the same interface but tell, but tell the compiler that, or, or change it so that we only compute the, stuff, uh, the static stuff at compile time. How does that work? So once again, we, from the user world, we go to the, to the macro world. And uh, once again, I have, as I told you before, cheated a little bit. I have a parser which now takes a field, which is a type. And the reason I'm making this distinction is also, it's also quite handy, uh, because uh, you have parser of t uh, on the top, uh, as opposed to just parser on the bottom. And it does extend char reader to parse results still because uh, those themselves we can convert into this function representation. So let me go through those first. Parse result in the user world was uh, a usual, I mean, a classic representation of an ADT. And in the macro world, what we have done is we've, we've actually played two tricks. One is, so what is the objective is that we don't want to ever con uh, construct an instance of parse result, right? All we know is that parse result will eventually give us either a success or a failure. So let's use that information to create a functional representation of parse result. So a parse result is a function, so it has an apply method, and which eventually returns a tree, since we're in the macro world. And it takes two functions. It takes either a success function, which when I'm given a value and the rest of uh, the input will give me back a new, uh, will be giving back the value I need, or it takes a failure. And actually, there is a bit of theory behind this, There's the, which is this uh, is actually known as a church encoding of, uh, of algebraic data types. So in this particular case, it might help to look at the type signature a little bit. So a parse result of t, instead of being represented as uh, at the top as uh, case classes, it can be encoded as a function which takes in two uh, which takes in two functions so either the success function which is uh, which will give you X or it will or the input in the case of a failure the important thing is that X we don't know what it is which means that we are composing uh, without ever giving you the final representation of what uh, of what the parse result will be and why we do that is once again what we have done is we have lifted uh, parse result into the uh, macro world where the functions are static. So the composition is static. And the only thing that is dynamic is the propagation of the values. And we can systematically play the same trick for a uh, character reader as well. So what is a character reader? It has a uh, source and it has a position. So it is, in some sense, just another pair, right? And it is a pair that takes an array of characters and an int, and it will give you some representation of this. Now we have seen a bit of theory. Let's go back and see how we implement this. So the char, the char reader in, uh, at the bottom has the following methods, first, rest, and at end. 
So how do you get the first? What you get, you get first is by saying, well, I'm going to pass in a function that will just give me back a tree, which is the position itself. So see that now on the right-hand side, I'm using quotes again to produce uh, trees. So what's happening here is this function lives in the macro world, and it is going to be evaluated at macro time. So this function does not uh, ever get executed at runtime. The only thing that gets executed is the expression uh, dollar $source dollar $pause. And at end is the same thing. Uh, just to be sure, uh, I'm just show I'm showing you how you can get back to a user world char reader, and that's again very simple. What you say is I I create really a char reader instance this time. Is everything clear so far, or is nothing clear so far? Okay. The silence is revealing. So let's then partially evaluate the right-hand side. That's the final step. And for this, I'm, I can actually show you how it works, which is why I have a blank side to remind myself. So uh, this is an example that you, will, uh, you can see in, uh, in the repo itself. We're writing a very simple uh, parser here, which takes an option of a digit to int and followed by a digit to int. So what is a digit to int? Let's go peek into our library. Uh, yes, that's the one. So our library says uh, that digit is just, as I told you before, an acceptive and it accepts any element if it is a digit, and is digit is a uh, method that is well known on characters. Similarly, and what does digit to int do? It uses map. Uh, so whenever it parses a di digit, it takes the character that is uh, the digit itself, and it converts it to its integer representation. Okay, so now, and uh, notice that we have actually put it inside uh, the macro itself, which is in test.scala. So what do we do? Now let's uh, compile it, right? So when you compile it, I'm going to compile it again because uh, just to show that, uh, just to show you what's happening. Uh, yes, that's because it has already compiled. Let's do it again by cleaning everything. So it's going to download the internet first, as usual. Uh, and then what it does is, since we're in the mac optimized macro, uh, we're going to expand whatever is in the macro. And uh, then here it's going to deep and print out a log of uh, the parser itself. It looks like it is trying to download the, ah, no, very good. I, I had no internet, so I was worried it wouldn't be able to download the internet. Uh, so, so this is what it looks like, uh, and maybe can, I can try to zoom a little bit more. Oh, very good. So you have this before transformation. Uh, if I can, actually, I'm not able to locate my. Ah, there it is, my mouse. Before transformation, uh, the parser looked like that. So that was the AST representation of your parser, and so using this partial evaluation technique, what you have done is say, okay. This parser, it tries to first parse a digit. So you will see that there are some places where you can identify uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the functions themselves. So remember that is digit is a function on uh, character itself. So we haven't, uh, we haven't inline or we haven't created our own handcrafted implementation of is digit. So the call is maintained. And similarly, you'll see that uh, and so you see that when it succeeds, you in increment here the index of your uh, lookup in the array by one. So there is no call to any uh, next method. And there is, uh, again, and you have here dot length, which, is, which would be the call to at the at end function uh, on a character reader, but it has been inlined, right? And then, uh, yeah, you can just go on a little bit. Uh, there is some... Uh, and here you can see that you have the map function itself where it says uh, 
once again, I lost my, my, my cursor. I'm so sorry. Ah, uh, there. Here, you can see that you have the uh, call to the map function itself, which is you're doing the two-digit operation, but again, in line. And yeah, this will run and will give you the required result. All right, that's great. So actually, that's more or less it with uh, the, the, the parse part of parse query. And uh, so initially, the talk was introduced as specializing parsers for queries. And, uh, and the, the query part of parse query lies in this benchmark, really. So what we're trying to do is that we're trying to parse a sequence of Booleans. Okay, and uh, a sequence of comma-separated booleans, that is. So it does satisfy the JSON format, but it is terrible overkill to use a JSON parser for parsing a sequence of booleans. And you can see it here, right? Whether it's fast parse or parse query, it is much better to use a specialized booleans parser uh, rather than a generic JSON one. Now, it's easy to create a... Uh, specialized Booleans parser. But say you have a more complex data format. And say you want to filter some things from that data format. It's much, more, it's much better to say, I have a generic parser for my data format, and I'm going to write some sort of pre-processing query to weed out the stuff that I don't need. And writing that weeding out the stuff that I don't need part by hand is terribly inefficient. It is, and it goes against all good programming principles as well, right? Because if you have a parser that is separately written and a query that's separately written, then you can always modularize one or the other. And whereas if you write a very specialized version, uh, you are stuck to that forever. And it's very difficult to come up with a different filter. You have to rewrite the whole program. So the idea here is to say, given a uh, parser, uh, and given a query on the data format that is parsed by the parser, automatically create your specialized interleaved version of the specific parser. So in this example, you would go from uh, a parser for JSON, which maps to a sequence of Booleans, recognize that, convert your JSON parser, specialize your JSON parser so that it parts, parses just a sequence of Booleans. Um, so, actually, I have 12 minutes remaining, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And uh, I thought the talk would take longer. I'm so sorry, but I only have this slide for you on that. But I can elaborate if, uh, if, uh, re if required, if requested, actually. So, the theory is worked out. I have, uh, we, have, uh, we have researched this along with, uh, actually, a lot of help from Eugene and Dennis and Jorge, who is uh, around. And, uh, and the implementation is on its way. And so what we have done earlier is to, to do some uh, benchmarks to first test whether it makes sense to go here. And, what it, and, and it does. In the sense that when you parse, uh, so the benchmark we had was parsing a sequence of uh, tuples which have, uh, of key value pairs. And you decide to choose how many key value pairs you are actually interested in. And, uh, as you and as you are interested in fewer uh, key key value pairs, your parsing time does indeed uh, dramatically increase, and the reason is the re the same that I gave you before, which is if you're trying to read many things and store them into memory, you are creating a lot of intermediate data structures, and that is uh, a heavy overload on your memory, and that is exactly what slows you down. It is it the problem is on the JVM that you run into. Uh, a lot more GC cycles when you store things that you don't need. So the idea is really try not to store things that you uh, don't need. Uh, so one last thing, what we have seen here is, uh, well, we have seen an implementation of uh, parser combinators uh, which, are, which systematically remove all intermediate data structures. But I think what I would like uh, you to take away more than that is Maybe you have a DSL in which you have intermediate data structures and you want them removed. And so 
here's a way to do that, right? So first, uh, use good uh, practices that are encouraged by macros and quasi codes, which is lift your DSL uh, to your own domain-specific representation. And then the second thing is to encode the staged data structures themselves as functions. And actually, uh, the theory says that you can always do this. There is always a functional representation of an algebraic data type. And once you do that, uh, then you partially evaluate the function composition away, which means that that corresponds to effectively inlining, and that corresponds to never creating your intermediate data structures. And yeah, uh, you profit. Thank you very much. Would you have any questions? Um, anyway, yes. You had a slide where you did something like a plus two plus three, and you optimized it to a plus five. But uh, you need to know for that that, a, that the plus operation is associative. Otherwise, you couldn't inline this. Do you have this information hard coded somewhere in your uh, in your parser optimization library, or how do you go about doing this? So that's a very good question. Uh, so that DSL itself is uh, not the parser combinator DSL. But uh, what you would do is to lift it into a, an arithmetic DSL. Uh, and in that arithmetic DSL, you would have some extra rules which will tell you uh, to, to look at the constants on the right-hand side. And then you would eva partially evaluate that side away. Yeah. Um, any other questions? All right, then I guess uh, we're ready for an early break. Uh, thank you very much.